You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we're live, but we got to let the stream breathe just for a few seconds. Make sure it's stable. Make sure we've got five gorgeous green check marks that Facebook's online with us. And we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is my partner in crime, my fellow football priest. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, when last we were able to speak with our great community, the Broncos were pretty much dominating the Patriots. There was a crack in the veneer in the fourth quarter couple of really ill-advised interceptions on the part of Drew Locke allowed Cam Newton to fight back in and make it a, an issue, but the Broncos' defense holds getting a huge win. I mean, they overcome nine-point spread here and upset the Patriots at home, handing Bill Belichick, Zach, for what it's worth. This is only the sixth time since he's been the Patriots' head coach he's, he's lost coming out of a bye, and I don't know how many of those were at home, but wow, your gut reaction. Well... I had a feeling this game would be a blessing in disguise for Denver getting a pushback from, you know, last Monday night. And it was, they were healthier. And the two players who made the biggest difference, I think, were Drew Locke and Philip Lindsay. They wouldn't arguably have played if the game wasn't rescheduled again. A win is a win is a win. Like I said against the Jets, I don't care if it's by one point or by 40 points. I'm not going to try to be the wet blanket, though I will say there is no reason that game should have came down to the wire. The the Patriots had no business hanging around at the end. If the Broncos' situational coaching and play calling, which we'll get into a little later in this podcast, was a little better, this could have been a blowout victory. That being the case, though, it's still a victory. Two-game winning streak now, going back home to Denver with a big showdown against the Kansas City Chiefs looming. And what did the Broncos just see? A Chiefs loss to the Raiders. That's a beatable team. The Broncos are riding high. Momentum, confidence on their side. Things got a lot more interesting now, Chad. It was just the difference in tonality and energy. I mean, obviously, that Jets win gave them a lift, gave them a boost, gave them back a little dose of confidence. But the increase in energy and swagger and confidence and intensity with Drew Locke returning to the field, with Philip Lindsay back out there being that emotional firebrand, it was palpable. And as I'm typing up, putting together the thumbnail for the YouTube stream for this exact gut reaction, I'm thinking to myself, you know, the Broncos jumped out and, and basically dominated this team. Yeah, they had their struggles in the red zone, but in both phases, defense, offense, they dominated the Patriots until that first Drew Locke pick in the fourth quarter. There is so much good to take away from this game, and what an emotional lift. And it's going to be really fun to to break it all down. But, Zach, to me, the biggest revelation coming out of this game, this victory, Broncos now sitting at two and three, is the emergence of Albert Okue Boonham, who we now know, look, the Broncos quit blustering about the blocking. This dude's a difference maker. You know, the rust was falling off him today in, in chunks. That was absolutely obvious. But this dude's still, Zach, let me just run this through for you. Six targets. He only – hold on. I don't know. Is that – let me let me update this real quick. Bear with me one second here. Albert Okawe Boonham, six targets. Three of those were in the end zone, right? Drew Locke loves his his guy. Oh, it just disappeared on me. Anyway, I'll, I'll find it again. But Albert Okawe Boonham, that was the revelation. Get him on the field. With Fant, Zach, I mean, the possibilities are endless. He has to help out Locke by catching that touchdown pass like we talked about. It went through his hands, but that'll come in time, Chad. But what you like to see is the instant chemistry. You know, even going back to college, there was no guarantee it would translate. And both players actually coming back in cold, finally getting starting caliber opportunities, at least if you're Albert O. I thought he looked really good, and we talked about, it might be a little premature, but that Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez duo with tight end, It's looking like that way. They're never going to be overly great blockers, but Albert O and Noah Fant as pass-catching weapons in this offense, it almost makes up for losing Cortland Sutton. Almost. But you can never have too many weapons. You can never have too many weapons for a young quarterback like Drew Locke, and uh, the fact that he's utilizing tight ends in a Pat Shermer system is encouraging. Man, Tim Patrick, two of your guys that you've been a ardent supporter of over the last couple of years really showed out today and came in up big time for the Broncos and Shelby Harris and Tim Patrick and Tim Patrick gets back to back hundred yard receiving games. That's no coincidence. You know, Zach and I, as your football priests, 
we are not big believers in coincidence. No. Tim Patrick is coming into his own. He did. He got a hundo with Brett Rippon. He got a hundo with Locke. And he's got a more established chemistry with Locke because they played on that second and third team together last summer in 2019 when Locke was a rookie. So really interesting, Zach, to see both those young guys. Um, I, I mean, Shelby's not young, but to see both those guys who, you know, they've they've threatened. They've showed things over the over the last couple of years at times that they could be real studs. We thought Shelby was going to get paid on the open market. Didn't quite happen. If he stays on this this pace, he's going to get paid. And Zach, right now, I'm call, if I'm the Denver Broncos, I am getting. I'm figuring out how to get Garrett Bowles signed long term, and I'm figuring out how to get Shelby Harris signed long term as well. And I'm also extending an offer to Tim Patrick. I don't even care about the investment. I don't care that Sutton has to be paid in a few years or so. You can never underrate the, the value of his shore hands, Tim Patrick. You can never underrate the value of his amazing connection and chemistry with Drew Locke. This guy is a restricted free agent in 2021. The Broncos will have Patrick under their control. But even in a good faith gesture, I would try to keep him. I would do my darndest, Chad. To keep him in house in this offense, you can never have too many Tim Patrick's. He is far from a jag. He is diet Cortland Sutton, and you know not having the full you know sugar regular Cortland Sutton on the field, having that backup, having a guy who's almost as good is such a big lift for this offense, especially when Jerry Judy's still struggling. No offense out. Alberto is very new. KJ Hamler's out for to have that guy step up. And by the way, Deshaun Hamilton, can we both agree now? This guy is less than a jag. He is terrible. Why they continue to waste targets on him, why they continue to roster him, I would cut him and cut Nick Vanette, two players right now that would make the Broncos better, addition by subtraction. Well said. I mean, Hamilton, both times they went to him on third down in the clutch. No dice. The first one, all right, maybe it was just, you know, broken up or not a great throw, but nevertheless, the second one, man, that would have been the dagger. That was the dagger the Broncos had been looking for all game long. I should say Throughout the second half, that would have been the dagger down the right sideline on third and ten. There's a dime. Shermer showed a lot of aggression. We'll get more to Shermer here, but that hit the lock showed fearlessness going after the number one corner, Stefan Gilmore, who is considered to be the best corner in the league by many. I mean, he's up there. In my opinion, he's top three in the league. Lock went after him because Hamilton had a step and he dropped it, Zach. It was unbelievable. <laughs> It hit his chest and just just squirted it out of there. How do you not even get your hands on it? This is Tim. This is the Deshaun Hamilton story. When he's not, you know, not diving for a pass or coming up short or pulling up lame, he's not giving maximum effort. He is not a good receiver, and the Broncos are wasting their time trying to develop him. At this point, I'd flip him for a, a 2023 conditional seventh round pick. Anything to get Deshaun Hamilton off this roster. All right, guys, we have so much to get to, more reaction, more analysis on this game, plus all of your comments, questions. Zach, the Super Chats are stacking up hot and heavy. So let really quick, we'll go through these matters of business in rapid fire. First, though, we got to bring your attention here to sportsbetting.com. This live stream pod is presented and brought to you by sportsbetting.com because, guys, gambling is now legal in the state of Colorado. Sportsbetting.com is something you have to check out because they give you sharp odds, low juice, They have in-house bookmakers, which means they're not a third-party provider of odds. They're not trying to live off someone else's glory or knowledge. They make their own odds, reduced juice, best prices. You get hassle-free bonuses that you can roll over uh, one time after one time. Uh, And then you get 24-7 life support, and it's always a real human being in the United States. But here's the kicker, and this is where you guys really need to pay attention. At sportsbetting.com, you can get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to 500 bucks. And it's not just one bet. It's all your bets. You can go play for a week. If your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, how it works is sportsbetting.com will cover those losses 100% up to the $500. And you can roll that over one time. So, guys, support the companies, the sponsors that support the Huddle Up podcast, and head on over to sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle. That's sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle. Capitalize on a risk-free week of sports betting up to 500 bucks. All right, a couple of quick other matters of business. I'll m- mow through these very, very quickly, and then we'll dive right back into what's on your mind. Follow the podcast on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod. Connect with Zach and myself. We love talking to you guys and keeping the conversation going on Twitter. Also, at Mile High Huddle. If you have those two accounts followed on Twitter, along with myself and Zach, you're not going to miss anything as it relates to your favorite podcast and Denver Broncos breaking news and analysis. And the last thing, 
quick uh, shout out here to head on over to huddleuppod.com if you're in a position to and get your swag on. Get yourself a football priest hat, get a T-shirt, get a mug, get a face mask. Christy, her superstar designed MHH shirt has been flying off the freaking shelf, Zach. Like our third party provider can barely keep up with all these orders. So Christy, you know, commission coming your way, my friend, you knocked that one out of the park. Um, So it's another way to support what we're doing here, gang. If you're not in a position though, to patronize the merch store, it's all good. Each and every one of you that are with us live, or if you're listening to this after the fact as a podcast on demand, all of you can do these three things. First and foremost, wherever you enjoy this pod, subscribe. Number two, and this is crucial, guys, on YouTube and Facebook in particular, like this video. And if you think, here's the litmus test. If you think Zach and I are doing a good job for you, share this video out there. That is the biggest and best testimonial we can get. It's as important, if not more so, than us going out and landing all the sponsors in the world. Share this video out if you think Zach and I are doing a good job. And one last thing, a shout out to our Facebook supporters who have just been phenomenal and your support means the world to us. If you're on Facebook with us, you know, 90,000 followers or so on Facebook and you want to become an official supporter, just go to facebook.com slash mile high huddle, kick the bit, the, click the big blue button. You'll see it easy to, you know, you won't miss it and become a supporter. Shout out to you guys. Mile high salute. We love you. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Broncos country. Who would have ever guessed that saving the world, making a difference, saving America's rivers would have been as easy as kicking back? with your favorite Coors Seltzer. Listen up. Coors Seltzer is launching the world's easiest volunteer program. So whatever you're doing, the way it works is by simply cracking open a can of Coors Seltzer, you are volunteering. And here's why that's important. Our waterways are currently at risk, gang. And you all know that. 80% of America's rivers, believe it or not, are drying up. Through a partnership with Change the Course, Coors Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. The way it works is each 12-pack of Coors Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. And the result, 1 billion gallons of water restored to 16 river basins across the United States, including the Colorado River. And that's just year one. And what's great about Coors Seltzer is it comes in four refreshing flavors, and it's one cool cause. Enjoy naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. And the specs are in, gang. Coors Seltzer is 4.5% ABV and only 90 calories. Wow, Chad. Watching the ups and downs of the Broncos upset over the Patriots was thrilling enough. But having my Coors Seltzer in hand made it an unforgettable and refreshing experience that I won't soon forget. Well said, my friend. So join the world's easiest volunteer program by simply drinking Coors Seltzer. You, yes, you can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Core Seltzer, you help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. It's that simple. So visit CoorSeltzer.com and find a Core Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12 pack sold through 831 2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly, Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. All right, Zach, one last thing before we dive in. Now, this is not a matter of business. This is personal. I just wanted to say thanks to you, Zach, to John, and to the community here, the the Mile High Huddle community within Broncos country. I felt the love big time, guys, over the last week. Had to miss, of course, Thursday night's podcast because I had a death in the family. My grandmother, God bless her, she uh, passed away. And so I just wanted to say to everybody, I really was. This isn't lip service. I really was moved by the outpouring of support and just positive vibes and the prayers that I received from everybody. So, you know, we're going to be okay. Everything's, you know, it's it's a part of life. You, you, you grieve, you move on, and it sucks. But having the support of my friends, having the support of my colleagues, having the support of the community, Zach, it just makes it, you know, it takes the edge off. That, that takes the sting off. So thank you. Chad, I'm sure I can speak for all of our community when I say, you know, our thoughts and our prayers remain with you and your family through this, and we hope that you can find peace and comfort. It's it's never easy going through something like this, and you once mentioned it's a part of life, and it's unfortunate, sucky part of life, especially this year, but you know we're all here for you, Chad, and anything we can do, you know, we will do. I definitely felt the love, so thank you again to each and every one of you. You made a big difference in my life, so thank you. Uh, Chris Hernandez, everybody knows Chris, 24-year veteran of the Air Force, bona fide superstar here at Mile High Huddle. And also he's up there on the MHH Mount Rushmore. We all know this. Jumping in, just showing support. 
He's feeling – he's riding the buzz right now, Zach. He's feeling it bottoms up to you, my friend. Cheers as well. And uh, Mr. Castillo also jumping in. Appreciate Thank that. You. Drew Locke has the arm, Zach, but not the smarts needed to be a franchise quarterback. Oh. He needs to learn from Brett, Locke, who threw three picks in week four, by the way. Locke did literally <laughs> really? nothing at the line to recognize the defense. Now, Mr. Castillo, here's what I'll tell you, Zach, and then I want to serve this to you. Brett Rippon did – I think Rippon did show in week four – a lot better command of recognizing the defense and and um, making pre-snap protection calls than what we saw from Locke today. But Zach, despite those two picks from Locke today, Broncos fans should be riding high that he came in and beat the New England Patriots after chilling on his uh, sitting on his thumbs for a month. First of all, let me just say this. Chad and I have been prepping you for the year of lock, and we didn't mean MVP. We meant this is the ups and downs of having a young quarterback in his first full season, and not just any quarterback, not an Alex Smith, not a Case Keenum, not a Flacco. This is a gunslinger, and gunslingers take chances down the field. They are naturally aggressive. He plays backyard football out there. I can't exonerate him 100%. He's still a young quarterback. Uh, some of the turnovers and decisions he makes are inexcusable and indefensible, but I will hearken back to the coaching, the situational play calling. When you have a quarterback, when there's a, a bobbled botch snap, you don't drop back to pass. When you throw an interception, you come back on the next series, your first play call should not be a long bomb down the field. I like the aggressiveness by Pat Shermer, but it was being overly aggressive. And being overly aggressive is the same thing as being underly aggressive. It comes with the territory of Drew Locke. And again, look at look at the position he was put in. Coming off the shelf again after two weeks, playing a Bill Belichick defense on the road, not having Cortland Sutton, ha- not having Noah Fant, not having K.J. Hamler. And he did enough, Chad. If the receivers helped him out, Deshaun Hamilton dropped a touchdown. Uh, Albert O dropped a touchdown. If those catches were Jerry made, Judy. Jerry Judy as well dropped a pass. If those catches were made, we would be talking about Locke as the MVP of this game who won the game on the strength of his shoulder. I exonerate him a lot more than the coaching and Pat Shermer. And I said this on Twitter. If the Broncos would have lost this game, it's not an overreaction. I would have fired Pat Shermer because Locke and the offense and the defense did enough to beat the Patriots, and they did still. But the fact that they almost lost was way more of an indictment on the play calling and the coaching as it usually is to me more so than the quarterbacking. I don't, I really don't mean to be contrary here, but I don't, I think it's, I put the onus of the way that unfolded in the fourth quarter more on Locke than I do Pat Shermer, with the exception of the second pick. You're right, 100%. I agree with you. Absolutely. That ver- that first play to settle him down after that, it should have been a run. It really just should have been, all right, settle back in. But I think what you saw there was Drew Locke had been throwing dimes all day long. Outside of that first pick, which was a miscue, he thought that was back shoulder. Patrick ran, uh, you know, the, the, he was just running the nine, just going straight. He thought it was back shoulder. That was more of a miscue than a bad decision on Locke's part. The second one was not only a bad decision on Locke's part, it wasn't a great throw into double coverage, and it was a bad decision on the part of the offensive coordinator. But, Zach, I loved in the first half how aggressive Pat Shermer was being with the vertical passing game. And as you just perfectly illustrated – if Albert Okaway Boonham catches that first one, that's a touchdown. The Broncos go up t- uh, seven nothing. If Judy catches it, it's fourteen nothing. And then we can go on. You talked about the Hamilton uh, drop and whatnot. It happens. It's part of the game. But you can't drop them in the end zone like that and not have it come back to to haunt you at some point. But one thing you know what we haven't talked about yet, and we'll grab Mister Boggins here. Love you, buddy. Thank you for the super chat. He says commentators hard nose brown uh, no, brown nosing the Pats. They made New England look like a victim. Eh, charge it to the nice. game, dude. Everyone everyone uh, still genuflex to Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. But, Zach, tip of the cap to the kid McManus, who went <laughs> six for six today, crushed two uh, clutch kicks from 50-plus. I really tip my cap to him. He just climbed up. If you guys haven't seen it on Twitter, you can go check out some my tweets after the pod. But McManus climbed the Bronco record books. Uh, today after such a a phenomenal, I mean, he's the MVP, no doubt. Let me just say this one more thing about the play calling here. I mean, it's one of those situations where it's, if it worked, he would have been the hero, Pat Shermer. And if it didn't work, he's the GOAT. And it didn't work and the balls were dropped and the plays weren't made. But to have that many yards and that many first downs and not get into the end zone, Chad, you know, it's to not hit pay dirt and to not put this defense away. 
And you can even argue that back shoulder throw was a bad call as well. Why call a low percentage play in that situation? Why nothing underneath? Why no screens? Why not enough to keep Drew Locke in rhythm and build his confidence up? That I put on Pat Shermer, just like the shovel pass on fourth and one, the Titans game. That was not an injury. That was not anything but Pat Shermer making a bad call. Again, it's not... 100% Drew Locke is blameless. He's still a young quarterback. He's far from perfect. He's far from a Hall of Famer. But I think the majority of our comments here would agree that the situational coaching on both sides of the ball is still kind of suspect. Yeah, they're still trying to find their groove. And the reason why I pump the brakes on, on, you know, crucifying them too hard is they still haven't played two games straight with the same quarterback. Like for Pat Shermer and Mike Shula, like, you know, you got to cut them a little bit of slack just because of the fact that, you know, they haven't been able to get into a rhythm yet either as a, as a OC QBs coach duo. And in that sense, I take some pity on them, but that doesn't excuse some of the big time miscues. And I agree with you. There were some struggles on third down the red zone struggles need not say more. And then that terrible decision after the first pick to go for the jugular. I mean, look, you could tell Locke was disappointed in himself, Normally, I think Locke is one of those quarterbacks that is great at shaking it off and moving on quickly, you know, short-term memory. But you can yep. tell, you know, he – the Broncos had this not only game one, but it was going to be an emphatic, strong, dominating victory. And that one pick called everything into question and brought up all – every Broncos fan right now is going to nod along to what I'm saying. Brought up all those old feelings about here we go again. It's going to be another collapse. And don't think for a second that Locke didn't have those thoughts enter his mind. And Zach, I think he kind of marinated on them a little bit longer yeah. than he might normally. And Shermer should have been smart enough to say, let's settle down. Give Lindsey, who Dion brings up here. Thank you, Dion. Love you, buddy. Had a phenomenal game. 100-yard rushing. 101, in fact, on 23 attempts, as he says. 4.4 yards per carry. Why do people hate on Phil so much? He should be signed long-term, no doubt. We don't. As you know, Dion, Zach and I are the champions of the Colorado kid. I mean, we've we've taken the fiery darts of of you know well intended and uh, Broncos fans and even those that maybe aren't in our criticism of the Melvin Gordon deal because we thought Philip Lindsay should have got that money. But Zach, just for a second, Philip Lindsay, good lord, it was good having him back. Yes, and uh, guys, raise your hand in the comments section if you didn't miss Melvin Gordon at all watching this game. Anything that Melvin can do, Phillip can do better. And he, like I, I put out on Twitter a few days ago, he will enter this game as the RB1A and he will finish the year as the RB1. He is just a dynamic player. He's always falling forward. He's always finding the hole. He can run inside. He can run outside. He is, to me a true three-down running back, and the offense just takes a different complexion with him in the ballgame, similar to Drew Locke. And when you have them together, and also keep in mind, what wasn't Locke facing today, Chad, when he dropped back to pass? For the most part, that is pressure, that is continual harassment, that was sacks. He went down a few times, but DeMar Dotson was, again, another huge revelation at right tackle, and I will say, without beating a dead horse, I wish Dotson was the starter from week one. The Broncos' record would have looked different a lot. By now, but it's it's very encouraging. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Well said, Smith Corona jumping in. Thank you, my friend. Locke had a couple of drop touchdowns, but the fourth quarter interceptions are concerning. It's definitely concerning. Locke essentially gave New England everything they needed to win. A win is a win in the NFL, so I don't want to be overly negative. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's something Zach and I discussed right before we went live is like, hey, man, we could sit here and ha- harp on that you know, four to six minute turnaround in which the Broncos just kept shooting themselves in the foot. Or we could talk about the, you know, 55 minutes of football in which they basically dominated the Patriots. Yeah, they they lacked a few, you know, over getting you over the hump type, uh, you know, from an execution perspective in the red zone and a few spots on third down. But overall, Zach, you saw the guys who needed to, the units and the players that needed to step up. Drew Locke, Philip Lindsay, Albert O stepping in for Noah Fan, Tim Patrick. Jerry Judy, another kind of he giveth and he taketh. Uh, Defensively, I mean, there were some studs today. The guys who needed to show out on defense today really did. Plus, Malik Reed emerged as a consistent playmaker, two sacks. So you saw this team kind of take shape in terms of what we originally planned or envisioned this squad would look like in 2020, Zach, before the injury bug decimated the unit, took all the wind out of their sails. But what this this victory does, Zach, now sitting at two and three, even with the Chiefs up next, is it puts the wind back in the sails and gives this team some real momentum. 
And who who was it that was in on the last fourth down pass breakup for the Broncos defense? That was Devontae Bosby. So again, him getting playing time, good things happened for the Broncos. Bryce Callahan came to play. The Broncos were even getting the the benefit of the doubt from the officiating. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. To, to me, the Broncos were mostly both today. So very impressive win. And I will say this, credit where credit's due. I haven't been the biggest Vic Fangio fan this year based on what I've seen, but he had his guys ready to play from the opening whistle. They wanted the game more. They were hungrier. They were the better team on the field today. And dare I say, he might have outcoached Bill Belichick. That's that's a big coup for Fangio in year two. And there were no effort issues. There were no intensity issues, no tackling issues, no gap responsibility issues, no blown coverages. This is the Fangio coach Broncos defense we were waiting to see since last year. And they're still doing it without Von Miller, without Jarrell Casey, without A.J. Boye. Can you imagine if we had a full Broncos team this year? From week one, nothing happened, Chad. It's still very maddening to think about. Yeah, if you if you allow yourself to go down that path, you could drive yourself crazy. So for now, instead of worrying about the water under the bridge, focus on the fact that the Broncos went into this game after a 17-day gap of inactivity and the NFL fiddling with their schedule. They get Drew Locke back and they get a win against a team that was favored by nine points. And so and a hated rival. Now, not a division rival, but the next most hated rival that's not in division, obviously, even without Tom Brady. It's Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. And Cam Newton's right under there, right? Cam Newton's another guy that, you know, he's still yet to beat the Denver Broncos. I think he's now 0-5 career against the Denver Broncos. So, you know, it's focus on the good. And Drew Hollenbeck jumping in. Love you, buddy. Uh, he you. says, uh, buy some swag, fourteen ninety nine. A win's a win. Uh, but New England shouldn't have been in this one. I'm so tired of Shermer. You know, and I feel that, Zach. I, I do understand why – Everyone should have high expectations for Shermer, but I temper those expectations somewhat with the reality that he's yet to have a consistent cast of characters, even at the and the quarterback position, Zach, that's the most important thing. And if you don't have consistency there, all the best coordinators in the world, I mean, this was technically, what is it, the fourth quarterback, even though it's the same guy, it was the fourth quarterback to start a game, you know, fourth different starting quarterback, although, of course, Locke had started three. But it's different uh, week in and week out. It's basically, with the exception of going from week one to week two, it's been different for these guys. And so for that purpose and some of the injuries, I'm still, for me, the jury's still out on Shermer in terms of I'm not ready to tender a verdict on him one way or another. He needs more time. He needs more of a sample size with Locke. Let it unfold. Let it happen. Yeah, I can't sit here and deny that, you know, injuries and a weird offseason and all these new moving parts didn't affect Pat Shermer and still does. But again, that has nothing to do with fourth and one tight end shovel passes or having your quarterback throw a bomb when he just got picked off. That is just coming down to play calling. And again, this is a guy who was a head coach for the Browns and the Giants. He's been around the NFL block for quite a while. He has to be better in that situation. And maybe I can speak for the, the majority of Broncos country who's kind of not tired of Pat Shermer, but seeing his inconsistencies and his criticisms, they don't, I'd say we're not worried about the wins and losses or the stats so much. We just don't want Drew Locke to be mishandled. We want the Broncos to develop Drew Locke the correct way and not stunt his development with another shoddy system. Is the reason they fired Scangarello. Supposed to get a big improvement in Pat Shermer. I I can't sit here and say that Pat Shermer is a giant improvement on Scangarello. Maybe you can, Chad, but it's, it's a negligible difference to me through this at this point? I've just seen a lot more. I don't want to get too bogged down in the schematic differences between Skangs and and Shermer up to this point. What I've seen with Shermer, though, is a better um, knack for adapting and more of a more of an aggressive pension, you know, more of a pushing the envelope kind of mindset. And I think that fits better with Drew Locke. However, Skangarello, I think, did what the Broncos needed him to do. And he developed Locke through that that biggest developmental learning curve going from college to the pros. And I think all the, you know, the big steps that that Locke took going from IR in the 13-week exile to starting in week 13. And the massive improvement you saw from him from that third preseason game to when you saw him again in week 13. Credit goes, and deservedly so, to Scangarello for that. But schematically, I think Shermer still has the edge. But I want to see him, Zach, be smarter in critical situations. I mean, even look at how 
slap dash, those Patriots uh, plays were on their final possession where they're doing the end around and the toss and then the, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> those are show, FU plays from McDaniels. They were, but they freaking worked. And so that's McDaniels. who's a veteran that just knows when to call the right play in the right moment. And, you know, it didn't end up getting him over the hump, but the, when he called those plays, Zach, every time they worked and Mr. Castillo says on locks defense, there were a lot of drop passes. I counted four in the end zone. Yeah. And we've touched on that as well. His receivers. And I think Zach, if you have a few weeks of lock under center and you allow him to build back up his chemistry and consistency with these guys, you're going to start seeing those, those drops, you know, get worked out of this thing. You're never going to eliminate them completely because it's part of the game but not in these critical moments where you're dropping touchdowns, you know? Right. Yeah. It's one thing to drop a, you know, a five yard crosser, but when when you're Albert O getting your first significant playing time and, and Drew Locke delivers a fastball, but a catchable ball, you got to bring it in. And that will come with time. That will come with repetition. It's encouraging. Like, like we talked about the overarching point here is that Locke and Albert O have a great connection and that's without Noah Fant in the game. You put them on the same field together. That is mismatch galore. Marvin, jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend, a name we don't recognize on Super Chat. Welcome. Welcome and thank you. He says, finally get to catch you guys live. Thank you for everything you do. Marvin, we're happy to have you. Stoked to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Just remember, we're live every single day, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mountain. That's 8 to 9 Eastern, with the exception of game day. Game day, we come with the gut reaction immediately following. So you can set your watch to MHH. As long as you know when the Broncos play the game day and the time you know that you're going to see Zach and I coming live to you immediately following the game. So thank you for your support, my friend. Uh, Justin Martin jumping in. Appreciate you, Justin. Thank you. And by the way, Justin, are you on Twitter? Because if you are, reach out, connect with Zach and I. If we're, if we're already connected but I don't recognize your Twitter, let us know who you are so that we can tag you, follow back, and, and give you some love and shout you out. He says, I loved watching us dominate the entire game. Our defense was stout and Locke was good. Hamilton is garbage, and I wish had at least one. Yeah, he wishes you know Locke had at least one touchdown. His numbers, unfortunately, don't look good, Zach, uh, because of the picks. But let's just take away the picks just for a second. He goes 10 of – this is what it would have looked like. 10 of 22 for 189 yards. But because of those two picks, his rating drops through the freaking floor – and he ends up sub uh, 50% on his completions. But, Zach, so many of those, as we've already touched on, were drops, and so many of them were low percentage, deeper vertical shots that, you know, frankly, they, they sh- a lot of them should have been caught. Like, this should have been – here's how this should have been, Zach. Let me break this down. It should have been more like 14 of 24 for about 250 to 275 yards, two touchdowns, two picks – and probably a rating that would have been a little bit closer to 80. But that's just not the way the cookie crumbled. Yeah, Locke definitely should have had a better stat line, but he didn't, and the Broncos still won, and that's the most important thing. He got the job done. He made enough plays to put the Broncos in a position to win, and they got the job done. And let me tell you now, you throw away that Steelers game in Week 2, Locke has moved to 5-2 and two as the Broncos starting quarterback. But tell me more about Justin Herbert, who's won as many games as I have as an NFL quarterback. Drew Locke is the player and the quarterback for Denver, not Justin Herbert, not Trevor Lawrence, number three, and he's here to stay. Terry jumping in here, Broncos country rocks, hashtag state of being. Thank you so, so much, Terry. Hope you're enjoying the victory up there in Canada as well. And and guys, real quick, a little aside while Chad's uh, restarting his router, I'm not trying to take anything away from Broncos victory. They beat the Patriots. Their season's back on the right track. They have momentum now. Locke looked really good, I think, for the most part under center. Not perfect, but a lot better than Brett Rippon, a lot better than Jeff Driscoll, a lot better than the, the crap show we saw last year. The Broncos will be okay, guys, and celebrate this victory. It wasn't pretty, but I'd rather win ugly than lose pretty any day of the week, and I'm sure you guys would agree with me. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> There we go. Naj jumping in. Big time donation. Naj, thank you so, so much. Forty nine ninety nine. He says, feels great, brothers. Back to back games now. Defense close them out. Not having Gordon and some key drops hurt in the red zone, in my opinion. From listen, maybe I'm biased. There, Chaz went back with us. Maybe I'm biased, but I, I don't think Melvin Gordon made much of a difference had he played in this game. The red zone calls, had they been there, they would have converted without Melvin Gordon. Uh, the touchdown by Alberto, you talk about the, the drop by Deshaun Hamilton. If this game 
the score was accurate like it should have been. It should have been a Broncos blowout. We're not talking about needing Melvin Gordon. Uh, Philip Lindsay, I think, was fine in his role. They didn't throw too much out of the backfield that I can recall, but he can do, for my money, everything that Gordon can do as well. What I love to see, Zach, was just simply that emotional spark that, you know, the intensity that Lindsay brings to the table. And, you know, even if he's not quite utilized the same way in the passing game, you have, even without Cortland Sutton and even without Noah Fant, Zach, you have so many weapons you can go to. You don't need to throw to the to the running back out of the backfield constantly. I mean, right. it's good to have it in your repertoire, so to speak. But, you know, you've got – I mean, it's an embarrassment of riches. And, uh, wow, what a very generous, generous super chat from Naj here, Zach. Let me just say, though, I think it's really encouraging that the Broncos can win against a Bill Belichick team despite these errors, Chad, despite the drop touchdowns, despite the turnovers, despite the the shoddy play calling on offensive times. They still emerge victorious, and that's what you want to see. Also, how encouraging was it? Locke got lit up, took a huge hit right on that shoulder, popped right back up, next play drops a dime right in the bucket. That is a franchise quarterback quality, and that is something Paxton Lynch never even dreamed dreamed of accomplishing flipping booch lock is our guy hey man look i i had more of a reinforcing um gut reaction to lock's performance today that he is the guy that they're on the right track than i did from like in terms of doubting it because of the interceptions zach did a great job uh, job earlier in the stream illustrating the fact that those picks and those decisions and living to fight another day and learning how to overcome them that's part of a young quarterback learning to grow and develop in the NFL. And, you know, even Patrick Mahomes has gone through some of those same, you know, uh, issues in games right. past, right. And especially in, in 2019, um, or excuse me, especially in 2018, but he just is the next level. I mean, we can't put Locke on the same, on the same plane as Patrick Mahomes, obviously at, at this stage, anywhere even close, but every quarterback Zach goes through those ups and downs. It's just a matter of, do you learn from them? And the, the one thing I didn't like, let me just say this, is Locke has been has shown up to this point a remarkable propensity for recognizing the mistake and not repeating it in-game, right? He goes, okay, that was bad. Not going to do that again. This time, though, it was actually two throws in a row were picked. However, the first one was a miscue. I, so you don't know if you put that on Locke. We don't know if the miscue was on Locke's part or if it was on Patrick's part. The second one, though, both he and Shermer should have been smart enough. But I got the overwhelming feeling coming out of this game Lock is back. Lock's the guy. Let's go. Yeah, I don't know how any Broncos fan, again, he just piles up victories. It might not always be pretty. It might not always be 500 yards and four touchdowns. But, again, throwing out that Steelers game where he missed the entire second half, he's 5-2 and two as the Broncos starting quarterback. He has shown guts and, and, and character and leadership and arm talent, everything you guys want to see in a potential franchise quarterback. And it's the closest thing They've had under center since Peyton Manning. All the tries and tribulations, all the failures, all the failed seasons. Why wouldn't any Broncos fan emerge from this game, interceptions or not, thinking, wow, Locke can really be something for the future? Well, and Zach, just the juice, I mean, just the swag, dancing on the on the field before the game, loose, energetic, confident, and then the arm talent. I mean, there was that one throw when he was he was fading to the right, throws across his body, splits three defenders, and hits Jerry Judy right in the numbers. That was a Mahomes-esque throw. That was a Elway-esque throw because Locke does have that arm talent, and he has so many of the other franchise-caliber type of tools, both tangible and intangible. It's just a matter of playing every game and and getting enough experience to put it all together. So my message to Broncos country is as long as Drew Locke stays healthy and remains on the field, I think you're going to continue to see really good things happen for this team like you saw today. uh, Big Kev jumping in. Big win, baby. Shermer should have never put Locke in that second interception situation, which I don't disagree with. That was a bad decision on Shermer's part um, schematically. Uh, but I think Locke would like the aggressiveness versus being conservative. I think that's the style of his play calling, or that's the style of his game in the play calling matches. And listen, I'm not a Pat Shermer fan per se, but if he plays to Drew Locke's strengths, I'm okay with that. Uh, Jason Ingalls jumping in with an extremely generous wow. and also symbolic super chat. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that, Jay Bone. Malik Reed, baby, local to me in Nevada. He's a University of Nevada guy. Really glad to see him come through today with some big-time sacks. Drew didn't play great, but thanks to the D, uh, we get the win. Let's hope Drew can clean up the interceptions moving forward. Hashtag 
state of being. Zach, one of the things that was most encouraging to me about the Malik Reed stacks as they came in key moments, yes. uh, when the Broncos needed to be opportunistic and needed to be predatory. That's when Malik Reed showed up in force. Yeah, someone liked not having Jerry Attachu to worry about in today's game. And Malik, you know, that's the thing. That's what made him be on the Broncos roster as an undrafted free agent. I mean, the Broncos saw something in him, and he took over the game. And it just seems like it's the Cam Newton bugaboo against Denver. Whatever pass rusher is back there, Bradley Chubb, Von Miller, Malik Reed, he always gets to the quarterback, or, or if Cam Newton's always going down. Let me just tack on, Chad, one point to Drew Locke. This is the only yeah. criticism that I have, to be fair. He cannot keep locking on to the first read, no pun intended. That's a big bone to pick with Locke is that he kind of fades back in the pocket. He waits for his guys to open up. But if he has that first read he's going to, or if he has the guy he wants to throw to, it's a preconceived notion in his mind. He doesn't even scan the field sometimes. He has to be better in that situation. There were multiple instances where the Patriots either dropped a pick or were right there to be in position for a pick. Could have had more than two. But, you know, if that's the worst thing for him right now, Chad, he's in a much better situation than I think most expected. And he's been inactive for a couple of weeks. I mean, almost a month in real time. So we knew there was going to be some rust, both on his part individually and then just overall the offense kind of fully sinking. But they still managed to be extremely productive and really take it to the New England Patriots for all but about five minutes of the 60-minute game. Carlos jumping in. Love you, buddy. Los chingamos. Love the dub. The defense balled out, and that they did. We're going to talk more about the defense also, BNS jumping in with a $2 super. Love you, you, bro. He says, I'll take it. Go Broncos. And, Zach, that was my biggest message. That that remains my biggest message to fans who might still feel a little unsatisfied because it was such an emphatic, dominating win that then it kind of crumbled into a they held on for dear life and managed to survive type feeling. Focus on the fact that your team, who was completely discounted, um, nine point underdogs goes into a place that is historically very, very hostile to any team coming out of a bye, and they got the win. Focus on all those good things, and also Zach, you know, regardless of who was at fault for the way it, it they kind of started losing control, the fact that they regained it and managed right. to hold on and win, <laughs> teams and players learned so much about themselves through that time. And it just is so confidence building for them. It's it's a it's a building block that they can stack on top of moving forward. Put it this way: the, the 2018 Broncos with Vance Joseph would have lost that game 1918. The pre-lock Broncos of last year would have blown that game 1918. Great point you made, Chad. Uh, they they can battle back from adversity. That's what you want to see from Lock as well. Coming off a two-game absence with a bum throwing shoulder, taking some hits overcoming interceptions and still having the mental fortitude to hang in there and deliver the Broncos a win. And that goes to Vic Fangio as well. Great job having the Broncos prepared. Uh, Great defensive play calling for the most part. The secondary was phenomenal today. Um, You you don't get bonus points for winning by 40, 50 points. A win is a win is a win in the NFL. And again, I'll say it. I'd rather win ugly than lose pretty any day of the week. Hey, the bottom line is the Broncos are two and three now. I mean, two and three. So, you know, latch onto that. Hold on to that. Justin Ansel jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. You. Albert O and Noah Fant are going to be scary. Let's go. Need touchdowns in the red zone. Yeah, that's just simply something the Broncos, that's a kink the Broncos, Zach, are going to have to iron out sooner rather than later. But <clears throat> now that you hopefully have consistency at quarterback, I think that's going to happen sooner than later, even though, of course, the Broncos are going to be drawing here an extremely hostile and difficult matchup. But at least this one's at home. It's in the thin air of Mile High. And, you know, the Broncos have a fighting chance. If they can – just think about this, guys. The good teams, like those plays in which Albert Okaway Boonham dropped the one touchdown, Judy dropped another, Hamilton dropped the deep shot down the right sideline. The good teams make those plays, right, in the key moments. And that's what the Chiefs do. Like that's – they're used to making those plays. They're used to coming up big in those key situations, whether it's early in a game or later. And the Broncos had those situations on a plate. It was served up to them by the football guys. They said, here you go, feast yourselves, rock on, and they came up short. If next week, though, they can put themselves in those same situations and capitalize, they can go toe-to-toe offensively with Patrick Mahomes, especially, Zach, if Vic Fangio's defense continues this momentum it has. I mean, talk about going from kind of being a bend-but-don't-break, middle-of-the-road type D the first three games 
to the last two being sack, Masters, pressure. I mean, that last fourth down play that you talked about where Bosby, he did get a little bit lucky because the guy stumbled. But nevertheless, Fangio sold out. Zero blitzed him, sent yeah. both safeties. And I like it. I love that. I was like, good for you, Fangio, showing some belief in your, co- your that your, co- your corners can cover. And it worked, man. It forced Newton to unload earlier than he liked to, and it affected the play. And so for those reasons, I'm a lot more inclined to take on an optimistic tone for week seven instead of just coming out of this going, all right, guys, now we're two and three, but we're going to be two and four. Let's talk about what happens in week eight and beyond. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not predicting a, a win for the Broncos necessarily. I haven't even looked ahead to the Chiefs game just yet. It's going to be tough with loving on Bell and Mahomes and all the rest. But I will say this. If the Broncos play this level of defense and they can just have a little more consistency on offense by consistency, I mean catching touchdown passes, catching balls that come right to you, they can go back to Denver and really upset the Kansas City Chiefs. Again, not saying it can happen, or I'm not saying it will happen, but based on the way the Broncos played today, I thought after the Jets game, if they walked into the Patriots like that, they're going to get blown out. If they walked into the Chiefs like that, they would have get blown out. But this was a different Broncos team today, Chad. Night and day different than what we saw any time at any point this season. They play like that again against Kansas City, and the offense just can hold on to a touchdown pass. You're talking about a potential three-game winning streak, and by then, if they, if, 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 if they upset the Chiefs, their confidence is going to be through the freaking roof, and they are going to be a tough team to beat based on how they feel about themselves alone. Coming off a primetime victory, they beat the Jets. Going into Gillette Stadium after two reschedules, beat them, dominated them. They didn't just beat them. They dominated New England from start to finish. You can talk about the final two minutes. That game was a dominant, uh, no doubt about it, Broncos victory. They, they do it again against Kansas City. This is going to be a very dangerous team who no one will want to face. Man, I just imagine all that momentum and the cool things this team could do with it if they can find a way to go 3-0 and on these last three games, or I should say mm. coming out week four, week five, week uh, I should say week four, week six, week seven. They can get three wins in a row in that stretch, man. They're going to be cooking with grease here. Hey, big John Mortensen jumping in, one of Thank our you, superstars John. showing us some love. Over the road truck driver, keeping that supply chain moving for us out here in the U.S. of A. Love you, John. Really appreciate you, dog. Pobby, everyone knows Pobby. She is considered and called by this community the princess of Mile High Huddle, and we love her. Pobby, you are so great, and the way you support us and the way you just the impact you make in our community is phenomenal, and it means a lot to us. And by the way, when you get your new shirt, we want to see that uh, that selfie. We'll we'll get it out there and put it on MHH social. So let us know when you get that. Uh, you should. You, I'm guessing you get it tomorrow. By the way, she says, "Yay, we won! Great team win at work though. Didn't get to watch the game, but glad to get the win. Go Broncos, man! When you do finally, Poppy, get to sit down and watch that one, <laughs> you're gonna be excited. <laughs> I mean, you're you're hearing a lot of the analysis after the fact, kind of how things shook out there. But man, Zach, think about it. The Broncos were nine point dogs and you know, they were discounted by the odds makers, by the NFL at large. I don't recall what your pick was now that I think about it for uh, this game, but I predicted a, a win. I went on out on a limb and I predicted a win. I think you did too. If I'm, I can't remember. What, do you remember what your pick was? I predicted a, a close Broncos loss because I didn't know at that point what the game was going to be. It was still for the Monday night game. And I thought no way Locke would play and he wouldn't have. And if he didn't, the Broncos, I think would have lost. Uh, but I had a Broncos loss. I'm not going to lie. I thought it'd be a hard fought close game, but nine point underdogs. I have three words to that. Let them be. Yep. And don't forget your, th- your threes in place of the E's in that right. hashtag. Tom El Greco jumping in up in Canada, north of the 49th parallel. We love you, buddy. And if you're on Twitter, Tom, reach out and let us know what your, your handle is so we can connect and shout you out. He says, Hamilton and Pat Shermer got to go. Brutal calls at the end. Can't blame Locke for three or four drop passes, two of which were t- for touchdowns. I I can get there with you on Hamilton, Tom, but it, for me it's way too early to say Shermer needs to go. Hamilton, though, Zach, what utility, since we know it's within the realm of the plausible, no one's getting rid of Pat Shermer right now. So, you know, put that off to the side. Hamilton, though. What if that were Tyree Cleveland running that route? Does he make the catch? Does mm. he make a difference? Hamilton made a difference in the negative, but could Tyree Cleveland have actually been there and made the play for your team and thus bend the dagger and thus bend the difference? 
that's what the Broncos have to ask themselves coming out of this game because Hamilton, in my book, I'm with you, uh, Tom and Zach, who's mentioned this earlier in the show, Deshaun Hamilton has come up small every single time this year. Chad, you could have made that catch down the sideline. I mean, it literally, there was a separation and hit him in the chest and bounced off him. He didn't get his hands on it. He is, he, I, I knew it coming out of Penn State. A lot of Broncos fans had high hopes for him. He was always so unimpressive on tape to me. He does nothing overly well. He's a master of none. And at this point, I'll play Spencer. I'll play Cleveland. I'll play anyone over Deshaun Hamilton who, like Nick Vanette, hurts the Broncos by virtue of him just being on the roster. He is that bad of a player. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, we got two supers here, one from Mike's, uh, both from Mike. Appreciate you, Mike. Thank you, and Mike. Zach, it's not a name that we're familiar with on Super Chat, so thank you and welcome, my welcome. friend. Uh, make sure you reach out on Twitter. I'm excited for the future when we have Fant, especially when Sutton comes back. So, you know, he's talking 2021. Sutton would have eaten up those dimes, and that I absolutely agree with. And then this other super from earlier, he says, the drops and picks scared me, but the realization that F- Sutton and Fant, mainly Sutton, would not have dropped those TV uh, dimes. Love the pot. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the Broncos are trying to make chicken salad out of chicken you-know-what, to, to quote my football priest partner here. And they're trying to get by without, you know, arguably their two best receiving weapons in Sutton and Fant. Sutton for the season, Fant for at least this game. Hopefully he's back next. And so tip your cap to the fact that Albert Okawebunum, the rust fell off in chunks for him today. He made a few really big plays, and he affected the game. Like the Patriots had to rethink their entire coverage uh, scheme and their strategy because of Shermer and Locke going after Okaway Boonham in, in those aggressive ways early on. And then, look, Jerry Judy, <laughs> those little plays make all the difference, that he just continues to just be close but no cigar. He'll eventually start making those plays consistently. And then Patrick, man, Patrick has been the – saving grace for this passing offense through all the losses, the ups and downs with the different personnel pieces. Zach, your boy, Tim Patrick has been the saving grace and, and Z-Dub really appreciate that my friend and the support means a lot to us. Smouse in the house. Yeah. When I was reading that comment, I was thinking to myself, Sutton wouldn't have dropped it, but Tim Patrick wouldn't have either. His sure hands are such a major asset for a young offense and a young quarterback. And I mentioned it earlier. He's a restricted free agent next off season. I would lock him down with a multi-year contract. I know bigger fish to fry elsewhere, but if the Broncos had 22 Tim Patricks, they'd be much better off. I'm a huge fan of his game, Chad. Let's grab D-Dub, longtime Super Chat superstar and MHH Mount Rushmore member. Love you, buddy. Really appreciate you, Dale. Here's what he says. I'm going to – it cuts it off, the complete question here or comment, but I'm going to read it here. He says, Locke had two interceptions which stuck out on the stat sheet, but he threaded a number of throws that should have been big plays. The only thing I didn't like in this game is not getting Judy involved. The defense played big. McManus, of course, gets the game ball. Agree with that 100% those last few points. And in the defense of Shermer and Locke, you know, Judy was targeted five times. He was the third most targeted guy on the offense. Uh, Patrick, eight targets, four catches, 100 yards, 101. Okaway Boonham, six targets, two catches, 45 yards. Judy, five targets, two receptions, 32 yards, and – one of those, Zach, minimum, one of those should have been a touchdown. So we would be looking at his fifth consecutive game over 50 yards, and he would have had a touchdown if he catches that. Now, it wasn't a gimme play. It would have been a tougher catch because you're in the corner of the right end zone and you're catching over your shoulder like this with tight coverage in the end zone. It's not something a normal average human can do, but that's not what Jerry Judy is. Jerry Judy is supposed to be an elite wide receiver or at least an elite wide receiver prospect. And he needs to start coming up with those those plays. And we saw that he's capable of it. He did it against the Jets last week. He mossed that defensive back, and it was very unlike Jerry Judy. But that's what we thought was a sign of things to come. And, again, a lot of Broncos country is fixating on these interceptions that Drew Locke threw. And, you know, for good reason for the most part. But he should have had a touchdown to Alberto. He should have had a touchdown or at least a long gainer to De- Deshaun Hamilton. You talk about the Judy drop. He should have had at least, at least two touchdowns in this game well over 300 yards, and then if that those two things happen, we're talking about Locke, again, as the MVP of this game and not talking about him like they won in spite of him, Chad. It's completely um, incorrect. Let me tell you this, guys. Drew Locke, if, if Drew Locke doesn't start this game and bring that swag and that 
arm talent and the dimes. Dude, the dimes he was dropping, especially in the first half, man. His if first he, throw was a dime. Yes, yes, dude. And even in the set, the third quarter, he was strong as well. It was the fourth quarter kind of unraveling over the course of two plays. But if it's not Drew Locke under center, I really don't think the Broncos come out with that spark yeah. and that intensity. And I think the Patriots, maybe they still managed to win this game because the Patriots were very flat. You could tell they hadn't practiced much. You know, they were very clunky and whatnot. Maybe you still eke out a win with Rippon, but I doubt it. So Locke was, he might not have been the MVP of this game in terms of performance, but he was definitely crucial to this team upsetting the Patriots at home. Uh, Jess jumping in. Love you, buddy. Appreciate the super. And he says, hey, man, get some wide receivers that make plays. Thanks for the win, defense. Hey, don't discount Tim Patrick, though. Timmy P has been clutch. It's nice to see you come around, Chad. It warms my soul to see you talk about Tim Patrick so complimentary. They have a boatload of wide receivers, but they're not performing all on the same page. They're not all synced up just yet. And not having your big fish out there, not having Cortland Sutton out there, not having KJ Hamler out there, not having Noah Fan out there, those are three huge difference makers in this offense. Put them on the field, we're talking about a different story. But even so... Again, like Chad just mentioned, Tim Patrick, Jerry Judy can make the play like as he's demonstrated. Albert O look good. Noah Fan is coming back. Lindsey's back. Melvin Gordon's coming back, more than likely. They still have many weapons on this offense, and with Locke at the controls, the sky is the limit. Jason jumping back in again. Appreciate that. He says, why isn't Cleveland on the field instead of Hamilton? Put Patrick and Cleveland outside with Judy in the slot. Nevada Broncos fan. Uh, hashtag Nevada Broncos fan. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying is, you know, coming out of this game, Zach, this is where the coaches, you know, I think Hamilton was a – Zach Azani, the wide receivers coach of the Broncos. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but my hunch is he was the champion pounding the table for Deshaun Hamilton in the fourth round back in 2018. And I think that he's been his his champion basically all this time – and he's unfortunately Azani because the coordinators rely on what the position coaches are telling them and oftentimes rely on the position coaches for the snap rotation in game. And I think at this point, Azani and Shermer, they all have to face the fact that <clears throat> Hamilton is more of a liability for you out there in terms of, yes. you know, when the, when the chips are down, you can't count on him making the play. And not only that, but you don't know what you're missing out on if you have a Cleveland in there instead of him. So, you know, We'll see what happens coming out of this game, but I think that's definitely something they need to look at hard. You have to recognize that he's a detriment, just like you had to recognize Elijah Wilkinson's a detriment. So you hit on the two points that I was going to make. One is coaching. That's the obvious thing. They don't get the better player in the game. It comes down to coaching and also draft status. Deshaun Hamilton was a fourth-round draft pick. Tyree Cleveland was not. I think the Broncos, like they usually do, they're trying to squeeze any remaining value out of a fairly high-round draft pick so he doesn't go down as a bust. And then at some point, it's diminishing returns because he's hurting the offense with his drop passes. He's costing the Broncos points and yards. I'd rather play any receiver on this offense. Bring back Fred Brown. Let him play over Deshaun Hamilton at this point. He brings nothing to the table. Uh, Let's grab this super from Mark Langley. Everybody knows Mark. Bonafide superstar. Bonafide MHH Mount Rushmore member. Always great to have you in the stream, my friend. He says, what's up, my guys? Ugly win, but... That's all that matters. Locke will get better. Despite the two interceptions, the defense did great on the road. That, uh, I miss you guys. I miss you guys. You all take care. Thanks, my friend. We miss you too. And I know life is, you know, the grind keeps you away from being in every single live stream. I know you're, you're listening to every pod. You can't be in every single live stream. But to his point, let's just talk about the defense for a little bit here. Vic Fangio, I think, has found his groove with this collection of players. And Michael Ojemudia, I think, continues to be impressive. I mean, he's not like flashy, but you don't necessarily need your corners to be flashy. You need them to be solid. Right. Bryce Callahan gets his first pick as a Bronco. You saw Justin Simmons make a play today. He wasn't an obvious, you know, I would I shouldn't say liability because I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but he didn't seem lost out there. Kareem Jackson made a bunch of huge hits. It was yes. a great defensive collective performance, and Jerry, one of our our, our Facebook supporters love you, buddy. He says, wow, still feeling the wind. Will be in the morning, too. Amen, my friend. But that some of the performances individually they got out of this defense, including Chubb, including Harris. I mean, it was great to see Big Deshaun Williams, and we talked about at halftime, getting yes. that pick. I mean, that's one of the most encouraging things, developments out of these last two weeks that should give fans encouragement that this team 
can contend with anybody, regardless of Patrick Mahomes, regardless of on the road, at home, wherever, because you got locked back and your defense is starting to click. There were a lot of great individual defensive performances today, but what the me that made the most difference, the, the point to me that made the most difference was the defense played together better overall. It wasn't just the secondary or wasn't just the defensive line. It wasn't just the linebackers. It was all three phases, the entire 11 man defense and also the play calling. I got to give Vic Fangio credit. He, he blitz when he should have blitz. He played coverage when he should have played coverage and Callahan looked good. Justin Simmons had his best game of the year, which isn't saying much. Green Jackson was like a knife out there and run support and Ojemudia what I like about him, Chad, is he gets his head around. He can locate the football, and he keeps the play in front of him. So my biggest worry was him being a Langley or an Isaac Adam. He is neither. So already he's a better prospect overall. He might blossom into a really high upside cornerback, too, for the Broncos. But Bosby's getting more playing time, and you're starting to see, again, we both made this point individually and collectively, they're starting to be the Broncos' defense we thought we would see going into this season, even without Von Miller, even without A.J. Boyer, the talent they have, and combine that with good coaching and good play calling, you see what happens here. So the Broncos' defense, I have very few complaints, Chad. They played phenomenally well today. And the thing is, man, all things are possible when you have your quarterback. Things just come together when you have your quarterback. And by the way, Big John jumping in again. Offense did good. Just got to get in the end zone. Really appreciate you, my friend. Terry up there, north of the 49th parallel, the original OG MHH, north of the 49th parallel member here. Love you, bro. Broncos country rocks, hashtag state of being. I think state of being came from, that was born out of Terry's passion up there north of the 49th parallel in Canada. And then BNS, money, McManus, huge weapon. Aloha from Maui. Zach, I have been critical of McManus at times these last two years. Me too. But I got to turn, I got I to gotta just put that to the side and these last couple games in particular, give the man his credit. He's been a rock. He's been a weapon. He's been more than just a rock. He's been a weapon, and that was on display today. Yeah, I was not very, you know, I wasn't crazy about the contract the Broncos gave McManus before the season. Made him the fourth highest paid kicker, but based on today, he's worth every penny. And he's quickly going back to being McMoney. And that's what you have to have because when you have a field goal kicker of that magnitude, he's a weapon. He's not just a, a player. He's not just part of the team. He can win or lose games on his leg. So McManus is back to being the old McManus, and it can only help out the Broncos having that weapon on the third side of the ball. WE jumping in, superstar. Love you, buddy. Thank I am you. really pleased with OJ Moody's play, especially for a rookie corner Clearly our best rookie at the moment. Crow on the menu for our boy, Zach. I don't think Zach was ever like overly critical about Ojemudia. That, not that yeah. I can recall. Uh, but, Zach, here's what I'll say is, you know, when the pick was made, in fact, I remember us what, what our message to fans was back in late April when Ojemudia was the third-round pick was, hey, man, this is a guy who I think could low-key threaten to be a starter as a rookie. And, you know, injuries kind of dictated that more so, but not really. He went out and won a job in training camp. He was a starter basically out of the gates, and he's just been really solid, you know, really solid. And as he continues to to get the speed of the game down and learn how NFL offenses attack and all that stuff, some of those plays where he gets his head around at the last second and breaks it up or whatever, pretty soon he's going to get that head around a lot quicker and start picking off some of those passes. And you'll see, and then, I mean, that's how corners develop as they – learn and understand the way the game is played, the way NFL quarterbacks and receivers and coordinators are trying to attack them. Over time, it builds up, and pretty soon they start using that to their advantage. And I think as this season continues to unfold, that's the one huge difference between an Ojemudia and a Brandon Langley busted third-round pick, Isaac Yadam busted third-round pick, is that he's got the talent, but he's also got it between the ears. And I think that's going to pay continue to pay dividends because I've been impressed with him as well. I thought this question was about Bowles or Melvin Gordon. I, I'm not eating crow on Michael Lowe because I, I never bashed him that much. I just criticized his lack of interceptions and missing that ball against Pittsburgh. Um, him not being, I think, the best Broncos cornerback when Bosby needed to have more playing time. And I think most agree Bosby is a great cornerback for the system. I'm not... I, I wasn't wild about the Michael O pick when it was made, but my again, my biggest worry was him not being a Yadam, him not being a Langley, and he proved to me today at least that he's not that. So uh, he's far from my biggest worry, far from it. All right, Zach, we are cro- we have crossed the one hour mark. 
but we have so many supers stacked up and you guys know what our policy is on this show. We leave no superstar behind. So these remaining supers, we're going to get to some, I mean, we're going to cover some ground here. We're going to get to some content, some analysis, but we got a rapid fire and we might not be able to let our hair down as completely as we might normally, but we're going to get to each and every one of you rapid fire. So let's start with Martin here who says, and thank you, Martin. Drew has 10 games left to play. I'm going to wait and see before I make bold claims about his game. Wait a minute. Two and three, 16 minus five, 11 games left to play, unless I'm incorrect here. Most my math's off. Um, he's basically still a rookie because of this offseason. So, yeah, I mean, you can't make any bold claims at this point, even in the in the positive. You know, let Drew continue to do his thing. Look at the impact. Look at the difference he made being on the field today. Even on an emotional plane, it was palpable. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying he is a franchise quarterback, but I'm not saying he's not a franchise quarterback either. That's definitely the case, and that's the question the Broncos have to answer between now and January. Is Drew Locke the guy going forward? And based on what we saw today, the answer is a lot more yes than it is no, at least for me. He has franchise quarterback qualities, and you saw that on display. You saw what happens to the entire Broncos team, not just the offense, when Locke is under center. So yes, he has 11 more games to audition to be the guy for the future. He's not being crowned just yet. He's not being carved for his bust just yet, but he's not a bust either. We don't know what we have in him, but based on what we saw today, Chad, it's definitely more encouraging than discouraging. I still remain 100% confident that the Broncos, they believe they have their guy. You just need to see him on the field more. If, if he stays on the field, everything else is going to take care of itself, and those questions are going to get answered in the affirmative. That is my firm belief. Eddie Vasquez jumping in. Love you, buddy. Thank you. He says, a lot of drop passes, but Locke was decent, minus the non-clutch picks. Lindsey was premium. And lastly, the defense was solid. Thanks, Chad and Zach. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Hashtag win. And then he also had this one, Zach, to say uh, shout out to McManus, number eight. So, Really appreciate that. And then let's also grab Dave Darlington jumping in. Callie Dave, big-time superstar. He says, I'm working today, but kept up with the game on GameCast. We'll have to watch it after work to evaluate. Lindsey looked good, I think. Hashtag Broncos forever. He looked like a man on a mission. I mean, you know, there were a couple of uh, a couple of plays where he almost broke it for even bigger. But this, yes. this his impact, I mean, imagine this game. And, I mean, he carried it, what, 18 times? 23 times. Judas Priest. Imagine this to, the, the the tonality and the complexion of this game if Melvin Gordon is sick with strep throat and there's no Philip Lindsay on the field. Goodness mm. gracious. 23 carries. That sounds like a, a RB1 workload to me. It sounds like a three down workload to me. And the times where he was corralled in the backfield, there was a lot of, you know, crappy blocking. Glasgow, I want to just make this note real quick. He's still struggling out there. I had high hopes for him coming into the season, but he has not impressed me at all. And I can't blame it on his ankle injury any longer. So if they can get the interior short up, also Dalton Reisner got hurt. Hopefully he's okay. If they can get the interior short up, uh, Philip Lindsay will be breaking those big gainers and those long touchdowns that Chad we've predicted since the day Melvin Gordon was signed. Yep. Amen. Seth Jenkins, a new first time superstar from small town, Utah. Really appreciate the generosity, my friend. And Seth, if you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out and connect with us. He says, I've been listening to the pod since right before the draft. Love you guys. Then he goes on to say, which I can't show the whole thing. It feels great to get the dub when no one thought we would. It wasn't beautiful, but I'm hyped. Zach, I think Broncos fans like Seth. And again, thank you, Seth. Deserve to be hyped and feel hyped right now because if you can win ugly, it's like you go in and play the Jets. That was an ugly win. You know, they won ugly. But when you can win ugly against upper echelon talent and teams and opponents like the Patriots, now you really are onto something. Good teams, playoff teams, find a way to get it done. It, it, so many of Bill Belichick's career victories have been so ugly, even with Tom Brady glory years, Chad. As long as you get that W, nothing else matters. Stats, numbers, anything. Winning ugly is infinitely better and always will be than losing pretty. Uh, Isaiah eleven twenty seven jumping in with a couple of super chats back to back. He says, and thank you, Isaiah. Yeah. He says, uh, uh, hashtag Cali Broncos country. For Locke, not playing since week two, had some solid throws that should have been touchdowns, and some he should have thrown away to avoid the picks. Thoughts? And then he goes on to say, also in one that I can't grab, but it says the Colorado kid is back. Hashtag 30 pay me. So to his point here, though, Zach, that he uh, had some solid throws that should have been touchdowns. Maybe he should have thrown away to avoid the picks. The first one, Zach, maybe 
I really don't know whose fault that was. He thought it was back shoulder. Patrick kept running. We don't know. The first one, I'm not going to render judgment or blame quite yet on that as far as who's, you know, who to point the finger at. The second one is definitely on luck. Like, and Shermer, both. They share that. Don't throw it into double coverage, whatever you do. I mean, yeah, if it went in doubt, throw it away. Right, yeah. You can nitpick about the first interception. Maybe if he recognized the route is not there or if he ran the wrong route, he should have thrown it away. But the second one, he was following marching orders. They dialed up a long pass, Pat Shermer did, and he threw it out there. I'm not crucifying Drew Locke for the second pick. The first one, maybe. The second one, definitely not. I think you're right. Following marching orders, that's a good way to put it. Uh, let's grab James Moss jumping in. First pick, in, um, first pick was a miscue. Second, if Patrick doesn't trip. It's incomplete. Yeah, ifs and buts were candy and nuts. We all would have a Merry Christmas, right? Pro- the fact is, no, no play unfolds perfectly. There's always going to be that trip up. There's always going. Sometimes it's just you know design wise, strategy wise, you just got to be on point. And in that moment, I think Vic Fangio is going to be going to Shermer saying, "What in the hell were you thinking?" <laughs> Yeah, and if they can correct that, if they can get on the same page, they're going to be a much more successful and efficient offense. But when you have that many red zone opportunities and facing an elite uh, upper-tier team, you have to capitalize. Again, the Patriots, a win's a win. I'm not knocking the win, but the Patriots had no business hanging around making it a one-score game in the fourth quarter. The Broncos should have blown them out. They can get a couple things worked out, Chad. They will put a lot of points on the scoreboard. Carlos Oliva jumping back in again. We really appreciate you, my friend. Thank you. He says, Locke's got a rebound versus the Chiefs. Hashtag Chingones. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's so much rebound, guys. I don't think anyone would be even using the R word right now if he doesn't throw those two picks because he went in and popped the freaking Patriots in the grill, sent Cam Newton back to his house in his probably a sh- short-term rental in Boston with another loss. Bill Belichick kind of popped in the face as well. My, the Mike Tyson right cross, boom, down. And that was Drew Locke along with everybody else. It was a great collective performance, but the fact that he threw those two picks, yeah, you want to see him learn from that and improve. There was some coaching complicity there, but whatever the case may be, they just have to harness this momentum, Zach, against the Chiefs. How do you rebound from a win? If they lost this game, that's one thing. If they lost because he threw two picks, that's one thing. But they, he did enough, and the Broncos did enough to win. I, I'm not knocking a quarterback who I, I believe is 5-2. and two. I'm not counting that Pittsburgh game. I'm not knocking him for getting the job done. It's not always going to be pretty. But if he could have played a lot worse as well, and he energized the entire offense. So rebound, no. Play a little better. Play a little smarter, maybe. Better play calling, maybe. But rebound from a victory, no. Jamal on Facebook. Everyone loves Jamal. He's got one of the coolest names, too, in the MHH community. Jamal Killings, for those of you listening after the fact. Cam Newton hasn't been himself since Super Bowl 50. I agree, man. Something changed for him emotionally ever since that. I mean, talk about a, a underdog story. I mean, the, no one was picking. This Super Bowl 50 was so similar to Super Bowl 32 in terms of, you know, the Broncos were like an afterthought because the whole – trope and all the storylines were no way that Broncos uh, can get over the hump with Peyton Manning, half of his physical capacity tied behind his back. As good as this defense is, the pay- or the uh, Panthers are just too big of a juggernaut. It wasn't even a conversation in the national perspective for the most part, and the Broncos went in and just dominated the, the Panthers. So, yeah, something's changed emotionally for Cam, and I think part of it too, though, Zach, in his defense, here's what I'll say. The injury bug you know, it's no respecter of persons. It can strike anyone indiscriminately, and it definitely levels the playing field. I just can't get over these Locke comments. And let me just point something, not that one, the, the point this comment out, Locke's first sack could have been avoided. You, you think for a fan base that's been so starved for wins the last five years, so starved for quarterback victories and quarterback success and quarterback development, especially a young guy, why are we nitpicking? I am the king of nitpicking. No one nitpicks more than I do. But how do you watch that game, which should have been a Broncos blowout and was a Broncos win, how do you nitpick to this extent? Was he perfect? No. Was he the worst? No. Would they have won without him? No. That's what I firmly believe, Chad. I agree. I mean... He's up on your boy. Marcus Duran jumping in on Super Chat, another name that we do not recognize on Super Chat. So thank you, Marcus. Welcome, Marcus. Welcome indeed. Very proud of the defense, says Marcus. Chubb's arm uh, Chubb's arm grab reminded me of Super Bowl 50. That's something we were talking about on the this, on this halftime stream. Drew's arm looked good, and Lindsey is the man. 
Shout out to McManus. Go Broncos. Yeah, man. I loved Chubb. Let's talk about Chubb for a minute. I know we're long, but we're here. Let's <laughs> let's talk a little bit about it. We'll have to, you know, remember, guys, the gut yeah, reaction is yeah. more about us sharing just our emotion, raw emotion, gut and uh reaction and analysis after the game and talk and and also soaking up your gut reactions and emotions after the game. Monday is when we kind of circle back and and dive down into you know more analysis. But let's just for a second, are you ready to say Bradley Chubb is officially back? I thought he was back last week. I I don't see him being hampered. I don't see him being tentative. I think his run defense is on. I mentioned on the halftime stream, his run defense is on point. He's getting around the quarterback. And even when he's not getting the sack, he's still pressuring the quarterback. Pressure is production. I would venture to say, I mean, what did he finish with today? He had four tackles, uh, a sack, which was a sack fumble, and uh, a solo tackle. I I mean, for a a guy missing Von Miller and still coming off the injury and still facing a good Patriots team, I think he's mostly back. And that's what you want to see, him impacting games, taking games over, being worthy of the number five overall draft pick. I was encouraged again today for Bradley Chubb. By the way, Carlos, we see that other super. I can't grab it. It's too far back where he says, love you guys. Keep up the good work. Carnales, really appreciate that. Zach, we got to do a few more reverse engineers. And while we do that, though, Anthony's point here is, again, why did the Broncos not run the clock out? They decide to pass and it gets intercepted. Crappy coaching. Yep. And that's not something we disagree with. These are miscalculations that hopefully this coaching staff that's still kind of learning about itself and, and the personnel and all. This is these are moments they got to learn from, but at least this time, Zach, they're learning from it from the from the benefit of victory instead of loss. Right? Yeah, I mean, if a young quarterback throws an interception, there's nine year olds playing Madden who wouldn't come out the next series throwing a long touchdown, you know, a long bomb down the sideline. Shermer has to be better. You can call me a Shermer hater all you want, but that's bad situational coaching, and it's putting Locke in a bad position. Other than that, it's fair game to debate how good Locke was, but if Shermer can just Tone down the aggressiveness and be a little better situationally. This offense will be much better off. Colby Collier, Collier, Collier. However I pronounce it. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, my friend, but thank you for the super chat jumping in a name we don't recognize. So welcome. And thank you. He says, what can we do in short yardage situations? Other teams have this like today, easy quarterback sneaks with camp. Well, first of all, ask Zach and Dak Prescott about how quickly a quarterback (laughs) Sneak can go south for your whole franchise. Okay. Good point. Um, but you know, Philip Lindsay's not a power guy. Those are the type of situations where you, where it would have been nice to have Gordon. Um, look, Royce Freeman, Zach, he is barely, in my estimation, a jack. Like he's barely just a guy. You know, barely just a guy. So I think that, in combined with maybe, you know, this offensive line, just it's it's forte is not power and that's pretty evident and obvious up to this point that you're going to have to come up with some oomph there though, Zach, because they have shown a propensity for just not being able to close those short yardage situations. Yeah. But can we get some play action, maybe something to keep the defense off balance, not having a a three wide or a shotgun or a, a, you know, just a a power. O. mix up the offensive play calling, have a screen to Phillip Lindsay. You don't need Melvin Gordon necessarily in goal line. It comes down to better play calling. And again, it's from the same guy, call a fourth and one tight end shovel on the goal line when he had Melvin Gordon. So with or without him, the coaching has to be better because they have the talent, Melvin Gordon aside, to get the job done to punch the ball into the end zone. Christopher jumping in, DL44, longtime listener, superstar in our community. Good to see you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. He says, Sylvester Williams and Malik Reed and Justin Simmons showed up. How about that BMAC contract now? That's another good point to the whole BMAC storyline is, you know, the Broncos paid him, and I was – I don't know if I would necessarily say I was overly critical because what are you going to do? I mean, you need a kicker, and, and kickers are hard to come by, good kickers in this league. But I wanted to see him get out there and really justify and earn that contract because he hadn't been that good over the last preceding two years, and so far so good, Zach. He's really earning that bank. He is, yeah. And I'll eat some crow. I'm not going to eat crow on Michael. I'll eat crow on Brandon McManus. He he looked. He was the MVP of the game. He won. The, he was the difference in this ball game for Denver. Sylvester Williams. I'll eat crow on him as well. I thought that was kind of a wasted pickup, like Billy Wynn last year. But he made some plays. Deshaun Williams. I'm happy for him. Shelby Harris. The entire defensive line balled out today, Chad and yeah. Simmons. Had his best game of the season, not saying much, but something to build off. Him and Kareem Jackson both looked really good, especially in run support. 
I'm going to have to ask my guys uh, at Broncos HQ about this. Why is with Jonathan Harris, the defensive lineman who previously had the number 92, on the reserved non in non football injury list? All right, he's not coming back this year. Why did the, Sly not get his 92 back? He's a th- first round pick of this team. He's a Super Bowl 50 hero. Why is he wearing 73 when the guy who has 92, Jonathan Harris, is an afterthought? I mean, he's he's done nothing for this team. I don't know what the exact um, you know institutional traditions rules are surrounding that. Maybe he just him. owns the number in in season and slides like, look, I, it doesn't matter enough to me to give you money. But if I'm Jonathan Harris, I'm acquiescing. I'm genuflecting and saying, Sly, look, all right, maybe you're not in Dominican Sioux. But you have meant something. You have a historical place with this franchise. Here's your number back, dude. Can you give me like a thousand bucks, maybe? <laughs> no. Okay. Here's your number. Still, you know, give it to the man. Yeah. If I'm Harris, I'm saying make me an offer. But I think from Sly's perspective, he's not worried about his number so much as him having a place on the team. He knows it's very tenuous, and he knows he's probably brought back for the short term. So I like that approach. I being a first round pick, you could have easily come back to Denver and flex and been like, let me get my number, made a whole hullabaloo. He just wants to go out and play. And he played well, and the more he does that, he can hold off to Marcus Walker and maybe even Draymond Jones. That's true. That's a good point. Um, real quick, John, sorry to do that to you. We I've left this one up here real quick from hold that hold that one from Ryan <laughs> from Ryan. Let me just grab Jess. He was waiting. He wants to know can we go on a 2011 run if Locke stays healthy? I think it can happen. I mean, again, when you have your quarterback, all things become possible. Right. Now, did that mean the Broncos are you know, cruising for a Super Bowl. Of course not. We can't say that. It's way too early. They're two and three. I mean, they've so many personnel losses, but could they go on a run and make force themselves back into the AFC conversation, Zach, so that when you get to mid December, Von Miller actually has a decision to make. That's right. And I think, yes, my, my answer to you is yes, that can, that can happen if, and there's the caveat, he stays in the lineup, stays healthy. Will it happen, Chad, if we had crystal balls, we wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. But can it happen? Yeah, anything can happen in the NFL. Could the Broncos beat the Patriots? Yeah, that was possible. No one gave them a shot, but that's the NFL. Any given Sunday, it's more than a movie. It's more than a cliche. It's really the way of life for football. I will say this. The defense, if they play like they did today, they're good enough for the most part. If the offense can just convert field goals to touchdowns, they can compete with anyone in the NFL, the Chiefs included. That's my answer to you. Will it happen? I don't know. Can it happen? Absolutely. If they play like they played today and just increase their offensive production a little bit, they will be tough to beat for any team. All right, just a few more guys, and then Zach and I have to dip on out for today. Ryan Steinauer jumping in. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Really appreciate the, the super chat. Make, make sure you connect with us on Twitter. I love Locke, but he needs to learn to go for the first down, not the touchdown. I'm not sure if that was the play call, though. Yeah, and that's one of the things when your second guess upon the first viewing on the TV broadcast, you know, even when you watch the All-22, in most cases, I think you can infer what the intention and ultimate objective of a, of a play is just by watching the All-22. But even then, sometimes you're not sure what the what the main uh, what you know what the coach basically in the headset is telling Locke like, hey, don't forget to do this and keep an eye out for this if you see this coverage or this guy does the, or whatever. We don't know. But in the case of Drew Locke today, Zach, I think his vertical penchant, like his aggressiveness, I think that was a message from on high. I think his coach has said, let's put the pedal to the metal, and because I think Bill Belichick probably went into this game thinking. Here's a team struggling, one and three, quarterback turnover, a lot coming back off injury. Like they're going to dink and dunk and try and just kind of control the game as best they can, stay in it and hope to have a shot at the end. But instead, what happened was Drew Locke came out straight up going for the jugular. And I think that was a coaching decision on par with just his yeah. own hunger and wanting to get back into the conversation as a quarterback and stop being an afterthought and silence the doubters. But uh, yeah, you know, you learn from that. You go, look. I took that shot because he was open. It was a lower percentage, but I missed the guy underneath that would have moved the chains. I'll take it even a step further. I think the the Broncos going out of their way to be aggressive, which they were today, came down not from Pat Shermer. That came from Vic Fangio. 
the same guy who wanted to be Belichick and, and literally modeled his practice reports and the quarterback situation, everything leading up to this game, he wanted to give Belichick a taste of his own medicine. And he f- must have figured Belichick knew the Broncos were going to come in, try to run the ball, maybe play horizontal east and west offense, and they took the opposite approach. I love it a lot. I like aggressiveness. I like north-south football, but there's a balance there is a happy medium in some situations, and a lot of it was play calling, not 100% either way, but that second pick, that lock through, that was dialed up. That was called to be a long pass. You can't put that on him for making that that throw. Maybe the first pick, he saw the wrong route. He identified another read. That's on lock, but you have to follow marching orders when you're a young quarterback. You can't freelance. You can't ad-lib. So, it's getting, like Chad mentioned, a great point. They haven't had any time to get together, Shermer. Not with a quarterback for more than one game in a row. So when you get that down, when you get the rhythm and you start to know each other's nuances and their strengths, those will be completed passes. And when they're not, they won't be picks either. Well said. Naj jumping in. Imagine how good this team can be if they consistently score in the 20s. Yeah, and that's coming, man. They were so close to being well into the 20s today. Two plays, and it would have been a complete difference maker. Uh, Jess, are we OG if we've been around since the 24-7 sports days? Yes, you are, my friend. OGG. Uh, Prank Films, jumping in again, my friend. Good to see you again. Thank you. Do you think the justification – this is a good, really good uh, topic – of releasing Todd Davis has paid off with with the run defense? Also, do you think Elway would trade for anyone at the deadline? For anyone? I don't know. I know Eric Trickle is dropping an article that should come out later this evening. Uh, with some different trade scenarios, so look out for that. Uh, but to his point, Zach, you know, the Patriots entered this game number one in the league, averaging 180 yards on the ground. The Broncos allowed him to get over a hundo, but remember, uh, Cam Newton was completely stymied. He had that 32 yard rush and then a 13 yard rush on their final possession, on his final two possessions. Up until that point, the Broncos had completely shut down the Patriots' rushing attack to the tune of somewhere around 80 yards compared to their 180-yard average. So the Broncos' rushing defense has been, in my opinion, one of the best in the NFL, so you can't really second-guess that decision to let Todd Davis go. It looks like the Broncos kind of knew what they were doing in that case, even though I still think Todd Davis is a great two-down thumping, you know, run-stuffing linebacker. We wish him the best in Minnesota. I think it was a lateral move. I haven't seen an impact one way or the other from Todd Davis's departure. I think Josie Jewell and A.J. Johnson can make up for one Todd Davis and run support they have. My gripe, though, is why isn't Nigel Bradham playing? Why isn't he on the roster? Why isn't he on the field? They're still getting worked by tight ends and running backs and losing contain in the middle of the field. Josie Jewell ran like a dinosaur today on that long Cam Newton scramble. You want more athleticism, and that's what Bradham brings to the table. So to answer the question, I don't see an impact that Todd Davis has lost, but I would like to see Bradham get some more playing time opportunity over Josie Jewell. The queen of MHH, uh, MHH jumping in late. Really appreciate you, Christy. Thank good you. to see you. Your uh, T-shirt has been a smoking hot hit, so thank you and congrats. As If you missed it earlier, I said, your commission check, it's in the mail or it's coming here soon. <laughs> she says, hey, guys, caught the end. Hope you both enjoyed the game. Nice to have another win. Thanks for all your work. Really appreciate that, KR. And we hope you all enjoy this win. You deserve this win. Yes. Uh, Tom El Greco, and then we got to get out of here. I think there's one or two more, but we really got to muscle through these. Uh Thanks again, Tom. He says, unsung hero, Zach Chubb, Simmons, Jackson, Callahan. They're not so unsung. I mean, those are the MVPs of the game. Uh, you can throw Shelby Harris in there as well. The guy just makes plays every single ball game. Hashtag pay Shelby. BNS jumping in again. Thank you, sir. 53 straight games to 53 straight games to start the, his career. Iron Man, pay him. Who are you, who's he talking about? John, did I, what did I miss here? Let me, look, let me see what was above. I don't, unfortunately, I don't really have time to look for additional context. Shelby? He, mm, I don't know who he's talking about, but. Uh, because pay Shelby either way. Okay. All right. Appreciate that though, my friend. All right. Let me just see. I think we are, I think we've caught everybody here. Oh no, we got, uh, whoop. <laughs> Steve Baumgartner jumping in late. Good to see you, my friend. Talk about a superstar in our community and an OG. He says, hey, guys, I have hope for next week. We'll get A.J. Bouye back, uh, Draymond Jones, Noah Fant, Demarcus Walker, Hamler next week. 
I think you'll probably get AJ back. I think you'll probably get Fant back. Good chance you get Jones. I don't know about Hamler though. And I'm not sure about Walker because Walker, you know, when, when you have guys like Deshaun Williams and you have guys like Sly Williams who've come in, band aid guys, and they're making plays, like, do you want to upset that apple cart? Maybe you ride it out with him on IR because there's no limit. Like, you can keep him on IR until you want to bring him off IR. Once he's served his three games, you can bring him back at any point. So, what do you think? I wouldn't play, you know, uh, Sylvester Williams over Draymond Jones, but I right now would give him the, the reps over uh, Demarcus Walker. It pains me to say, I think for sure you're getting Boye back next week. Noah Fant, he was a game time decision, so he could have played today if the Broncos really needed him. I, both those guys for sure. To me, Chad, uh, KJ Hamler should be on IR for three games just to rest up that hamstring. Uh, he's still a ways away from returning. I wouldn't think he returns, though I want him to because that would mean less of Deshaun Hamilton, and we all could use more of that. By the way, BNS was talking about bowls with the 53 games. Oh, okay. And I am, I really was the first quarter of the season. I was, I was happy to see him playing well, bowls, but I was like, let's hold off before we get out over our skis on. Let's just get him signed up. But I'm ready now, dude. Maybe you could say, well, what different five games over three games or four games? How come now you're changing your tune? He has been a stud, dude. I'm sorry to tell the haters. Garrett Bowles is playing at a near elite level at left tackle. And it's just great to see that all the long suffering and patience and pain that the fans and the team went through t- dealing with his learning curve finally has paid off because he's playing. He's up there, dude. And if the Broncos don't pay him all that pain, Zach, and suffering that they went through and frustration and the first round pick and it's all for naught. So I hope they do. And, and Jaeger, by the way, he says, Hey guys, thanks for the low cast app. That was from Albert Knoppers, by the way, one of our superstars and Facebook supporters. That was his suggestion. It's a great uh, for streaming. I thank you properly. Can't figure out Patreon. We're not on Patreon, my friend, but uh, you have. if you would like to super chat, that's one way that you can support what we do here. Um, all right, Zach, anything else before we dip out of here? I will say on Garrett Bowles, I'd rather the Broncos, if they're going to pay him, do it now and not wait till March where his value can go up and he can take uh, you know visits with other teams. Get him done now. The Broncos will be saving some money in the long term. I've been very, very hesitant to crown Garrett Bowles as being refreshed and renewed and new and improved, but it's looking like now it's not a fluke. It's not just a trend. It's consistency, and that's what you want to see out of him. So if the Broncos are going to pay him, do it now. Amen. All right, guys, follow the pod. <clears throat> excuse me. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. Follow the main account at Mile High Huddle. Uh, my partner, Zach Kelberman, as you can see, at Kelberman NFL. Myself at Chad N. Jensen. And then also our producer, John Cronenberg on Twitter at John K M H H. Check out the merch store when you get some time, if you're in a position to, and uh, do not forget to like this video before you bounce on out of here. And again, guys, the biggest testimonial is if you like what we're doing here, you think we're doing well, we're doing a good job, share this out there, man, share it out. It really helps. It's just as important to us as landing sponsors. So please do that. And then one last thing before we dip out, shout out to George Vandermark. Everyone knows him as Geo Wright. He's been dealing with the bug that shall go unmentioned. He's on the recovering end of that, but it had some effects on him that have just been really tough. So uh, thoughts and prayers go out to George. Everyone knows George, a superstar in our community. Uh, But we'll be back, excuse me, guys, tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern, to analyze the aftermath and kind of pick up the pieces. We'll see by then what some of the talking points have been from the players and coaches after the game and have some time to really focus our analysis. But Zach, Big win. Fans should be riding high right now. Forget the two picks. The Broncos should be riding high right now. And you got momentum going into a tough game against the uh, the Chiefs. So, my friend, have a great start to your week. You too. But tough game, but beatable game. As the Broncos prove, when they play to their standard, to their potential, they can take down even the best teams in the NFL. So, yes, don't poo-poo a victory. Don't look for nitpicking and, and don't look for splitting hairs. A win is a win is a win in the NFL. You never apologize for them. You never discount them. The Broncos are on a two-game winning streak. That is the overarching point for today. All right, guys. Thanks for sticking with us. Mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars. We love you and our Facebook supporters. For John, for Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll see you tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.